actually need. So let's, let's go for it. <laughs> People right. just keep on popping in here as we go. Let's see. All right. Well, welcome everybody. Good to see your faces, um, your virtual faces, as it were. Let me um, get my screen pulled up here, and then we'll let's see. There it is. We'll get going. Are you all hearing the chime? Like when people come in? Is it just me? Okay, good. I think it's no. just the host and co-host that hear it. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah, because that would be really annoying. Okay. <laughs> All right, so welcome. Um, my name is Jennifer Pusateri. I'm one of the co-leaders of our UDL HD network here. And I'll let Eric introduce himself real quick. Sure, I'm Eric Moore. I'm a Universal Design for Learning uh, Specialist at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, where I uh, serve with some of the good folks that we'll be sharing here today. And I'm also with Jenna, a co-chair of the network. So our agenda for today, we've got um, just a couple quick uh, announcements we need to kind of cram in here before we make sure that um, our presenters get the amount of time that they deserve. So we'll just dive right in and then we'll uh, make sure we get them up and going. So obviously welcome. Our meeting is today from 3 to 4.30. Um, we do have a shared Google Doc that is in the chat box now. Um, Eric, if you are able to copy that again and, and paste that back in the chat box, that'd be great. Please go in and sign in so we know who was here. Um, and if you want to go ahead and put down the date for our next meeting, that is going to be May 18th. And today we're really focusing in on UDL and the digital environment, which we're all pretty familiar with at the moment. So that's good. So one of the housekeeping things we needed to chat about today was our charter amendments. So part of our charter, um, when we wrote that, we realized that we were there's no way we were going to foresee everything that was going to come up. So we um, built some flexibility into that. And, and one of the things we built in was the option to have amendments. And so um, there is a link in the slides. You can get to the slide link on the Google Doc, actually. Um, there's a link that's in the slides, and you can click on that, and it will take you to a proposal form. So if you've read through the charter and you see something that maybe we need to tweak, um, you can put in your own proposal for an amendment, and then um, the leadership will uh, decide on you know how time sensitive is this thing do we need to send this out right now or can this wait perhaps until our next uh, quarterly meeting and then um, after that we'll get back in touch with people so again if you are a udl and higher ed member you can um, uh, offer up an amendment proposal so eric and denia and i um, as we were sort of thinking through these positions we decided that it looks like these are these are going to be bigger than we thought. So we um, submitted two proposals. These went out on January the 26th. So if you did not get that email, um, make sure that Eric or I have your contact info so that we can add you to the list. Um, but we sent out these amendment proposals and both of them were passed. So we're going to be splitting the communications and marketing positions into two, two separate positions. And the Digicon chair now will be able to decide if they would like to have a co-chair as well. And so that uh, both of those passed. Thank you if you were one of the folks that went in and voted for that. We appreciate that. And then is Denya here yet? Did anybody see Eric? Did you see if she came in? I have not seen her. Yet. Ooh, <laughs> yes. All right. So Denya is our um, elections officer and she is going to give us the results of our most recent elections. Let's see. Yes. So um, thank you again, everyone, for. Uh, Everyone who voted, I appreciate it. And our, our nominees and our candidates for sending all the, your materials and uh, also the elections committee for helping, helping me <laughs> through this process and also the co-chairs, of course. So, um, our, uh, so we have our roles, as you can see. Um, the communications chair is gonna be Les Tyler Johnson, congratulations. Uh, marketing chair, Anne Gagne, congrats. And our secretary treasurer, Mark Nichols. Congratulations to everybody. So, um, yeah, thanks everyone. This was our first time doing this. So, welcome to any feedback, and we'll continue learning <laughs> from one another. And yeah, thank you for this opportunity to serve the network. And I look forward to collaborating with folks in the future. And also, to elections committee, you guys rock. Thank you so much. And anything else? Did I miss anything? <laughs> I, think that, I think that's pretty much it. Oh, we do have some upcoming elections. So if you did not get a chance to throw your name in the in the ring, 
we would love for folks to think about, um, you know, how you can be part of this group, be part of the leadership of this group. So we are going to be um, replacing Eric in May and June. And so we're looking for someone to step up and join me as co-chair of the, our network. We're also maybe looking for um, a Digicon chair or possibly co-chairs for, um, for our Digicon. So think about that. Consider if that's something that you would be willing to do. Um, we do need officers, so we would love it if you could step up. And then Eric's going to give us a quick uh, Digicon update. All right. Well, so um, it was a great Digicon. We had about 265 registered attendees, and they came from eight countries on four continents. So we're really excited to see that international representation, though we know that we have more work to do um, to continue to increase the global reach of this, this event to help fulfill our our vision and mission for what the Digicon is to be. Um, you know, the, the Digicon is really our only source of income right now, and we have some big plans for what we want to do with this income, which is why we're bringing in Mark as our treasurer um, to help help guide that, that process. Um, but so we brought in almost $20,000. And so um, we will have some ideas that will be floating, watch for opportunities to vote or to chime in on, on different initiatives that we can take. And as we continue to expand our revenue, we can do things like scholarships or grants, you know, or um, sponsor podcasts like Thank You DL is one of the things that we're floating around right now, that sort of thing. So um, that's exciting to see that, that opportunity. Uh, the feedback overall on the Digicon was excellent. So 92.5% of people said it was either excellent or very good um, on a Likert scale going down to fair and poor. So that was good. Um, and then 7.5% uh, basically everybody else said it was good. So 100% said it was good or better. <laughs> um, so we'll take that. We feel really good about that and, and all the volunteers and effort that went into that. Um, so thank you to everybody who was part of that, either as, as a a facilitator or as a participant or both. So um, the proceedings for that, I did send out an email with uh, a link to the Zoom, to the YouTube playlist um, that's unlisted at this time. So that's for the people who, who did have a ticket, you have early access to that. The captions are rolling in. Verbit, our sponsor, is captioning them directly into YouTube. So as soon as they're captioned, they're there. Um, so most of those are there. We had a few sessions that are going to be re-recorded because of a technical error. Um, so soon we will have all of the sessions up in there. Um, we appreciate your patience, but most of it is there. So if um, you attended and you want to go back and see the sessions that you couldn't see, please do that. If you couldn't attend, um, it will go public um, probably in a month or two's time. We're going to post it to Learning Design, and then anybody uh, who wants to can go benefit from the wisdom of that um, the presentations there. Uh, we're also going to, so we have great feedback. We had about 40 or 50 percent of attendees fill out the evaluation, which is very good for getting a representative sample. And so um, I'll be calling for the Digicon committee to come back together to do sort of a qualitative analysis of the feedback there um, and use that to feed into how to continue to improve going into future years. Great. Thank you, Eric, for that update. So we're going to dig right in. Um, this is actually our first member spotlight, uh, official member spotlight meeting. So we're really excited to have um, two different groups today that are going to present for us. So our first group is Dara Ryder, who is with Ahead Ireland, and Mark Glenn, who's with Dublin City University. So I'm going to stop sharing, then they can take on over whenever they get set. Great. Thanks a million. Um, hope we, can you guys see that okay? Almost. It's working. There we go. Perfect. Thanks, Jen. Yeah, so uh, my name is Dot Ryder, and I am the CEO of AHEAD. So AHEAD is a, an NGO based in Ireland, um, whose mission is to create inclusive environments in education and employment for people with disabilities. So we would work uh, primarily in the access to tertiary education, so further education and training and higher education, in support and access uh, throughout, that, um, throughout further and higher education, and then supporting the um, work on into graduation. So we, we do a a whole number of programs in, into um, the employment space as well. So the transition on into employment and looking at how graduates actually access the workplace. And Mark, would you like to give yourself a quick intro there? My name is Mark Lynn and I'm the head of the Teaching Enhancement Unit in Dublin City University. And that is our, our own teaching and learning unit. And I'm responsible not just for the, the pedagogy that goes on, but also the learning technologies. Yeah, so I suppose what we're 
trying to do is I call this UDL macro to micro and it's got this big fancy highfalutin title and really that's mostly to kind of make me and Mark sound a little bit smarter than we are in real life uh, but actually what it's talking about really it's trying to reflect on is some of the work ahead is doing here in Ireland and how we try to link all these different levels of stuff that's happening because we have all this brilliant practitioner engagement where maybe individuals are sitting in their own kind of silos doing really interesting things and then we have okay how does that link to what that's actually happening at a at a, an institutional level um, in local communities of, of, um, you know, and how that actually, how do the, the institutions actually support that and make sure that they have the, the, both the policy level and then the actual resources and other infrastructural um, resources that they need. And then you have the national picture. How does that all link up with actually the, the goals of, of the national agencies which are um, concerned with education? I suppose uh, we have to take into account here when we uh, talk about Ireland that it's a very small country. So, you know, Ireland we would be probably equivalent to quite a small American state in size. So, you know, when we talk about national, you can maybe even reimagine some of those things as as um, as statewide or or potentially even some of the smaller regional things. So, yeah, I suppose what we're going to do is um. Uh, within that, you know, th these are just some of the key things that we might look at when we uh, that might apply across all countries about things that might need to happen at different levels. This is a very confusing map, and I realise as I'm talking about this that it's that it's not the most UDL picture I've ever put up in my life. Uh, but I suppose my talk today is going to be concerned with further education and training. And in terms of, I know there's a lot of American audience here today, so the, I suppose the analog for that in America, probably closest one would be the the community college sector. But there isn't a direct analog. It does. Um, I suppose it covers uh, things like um, your your sort of post secondary education. It also covers things like apprenticeships or work based learning if you're learning how to do trades. But it also includes things like youth reach, which are centres that can are concerned with um, students who who fall out of secondary school and kind of need a path back into education. So it's quite a, a diverse sector, and I'm really going to talk about some uh, in particular um, the UDL for for FET project. So when I say FET, I'm talking about further education and training for the for the rest of of this talk. And now on the higher education side in Ireland, Mark is going to focus, I suppose, very tightly at the institutional level about all the great work that he's doing in DCU and um, promoting the sort of infrastructural supports that need to be there and um, to make UDL happen and, and to encourage UDL practice. Um, so in terms of uh, what, what things you might recognize at these different macro, meso, micro levels, okay, you might talk about state policy, and um, you might talk about things like uh, performance agreements or I'm not sure exactly what the system would be in each every local area but in Ireland here what happens is that institutions have agreements with the state educational bodies that relate to funding or they have targets and KPIs around different indicators um, and you have things like national CPD or national guidance so that's guidance that's sort of if you like sanctioned at a state level in some way. And at the meso level okay you have your institutional policy um, and that means things you know, that can go across a whole range of areas or it could be very specific policy relating to UDL or it could be policy maybe that's UDL can support um, and that's, that's another very uh, important aspect is kind of mapping uh, how UDL can support those other policies and you have also of course the infrastructural supports we talk about things like the digital environment uh, the physical environment are those um, extra tools that practitioners need and of course the, the networks the, the community how do we support building of communities as well and then at the micro level of course you have your individual practice and you have how do you get the individuals to actually actively engage and want to engage with all the infrastructural stuff that's happening at the, the MISO level. Um, so yeah, I'm just got our example. I suppose today, from from an ahead perspective, is the UDL for FET project, and it's going to give, um, I suppose, some idea of how we're trying to connect some of these things up um, on the the FET side, the further education and training side, here in Ireland. Um, mm -hmm. So essentially, what's happened with the UDL for FET project is that in um, 2018, uh, this began and. Uh, Sullis, who are the state body for further education in Ireland, engaged ahead in this dialogue because, because of some of the work that we've done in it and became interested in the topic and how it could support them to meet their strategic goals around inclusion. Uh, so we've worked with them, I suppose, over those years. So first of all, we started by creating a scoping document um, and that was guided by a, a, a national committee for universal design in FE. A universal design for learning in FET, which was set up. And that scoping document really sought to look at 
why is UDL, give it a, a research basis for what we're doing. So why is UDL a suitable model for looking at, for, for the FET sector? And what are the key things that may need to be considered when we want to encourage the implementation in FET? Um, and what's next, you know, what's, what's, what's the next stages? Uh, so as a result of that, I suppose, uh, some of the things that we've been able to achieve and we go into more detail of this very, uh, um, very shortly is at the macro level, we've been talking about inclusion at the national strategy for FET generally. So we have inclusion of UDL within that strategy now. Uh, we have a national guidance produced, which is about to be uh, launched very, very shortly. So that's, again, guidance that uh, has, if you like, the state seal of approval. Um, what, with that guidance, a really exciting part is that they, that guidance actually gets included now in our performance uh, agreements. So between each regional uh, further education and training body, they have to report to the state body on, on what happens across a whole range of indicators. And now UDL and it's and more specifically the implementation of the guidance is actually something that they have to report on and evidence each time around. How are they supporting that? Um, at the national level, uh, we have look at CPD and, and how can we provide a more national picture with CPD and try to, I suppose, as well, connect all of these dots that are happening in different institutions and give us a more um, national uh, language and understanding of what UDL is and what the practice might, might look like. And then we have these inclusion networks that are popping up around it. Mostly actually they're much more organically led within those different areas, but it's how can we, we support the building of the connections between all of these things. Uh, so I suppose the, stra the, the strategy part, because I think that's the, the high level part, that's the part that we know that means that once it goes into national strategy, we talk about money, we talk about resources, because um, that flows from, from down. So once once the national strategy there, that affects what happens at the, the sort of meso level in terms of their own policy building and their own practice, and it enables them to link into funding streams, etc. So with the new FET strategy, uh, it was launched in 20. The summer of 2020, summer of last year, and through that dialogue that we've been having with SOS, we've been, um, I suppose, able to help shape that in some way or have a, a you know, a good voice at that table when that document was being shaped. And you can see uh, on the screen here at the moment, there's three pillars uh, of that strategy, and that's at the high level, it's split into three pillars, and one of those pillars is now inclusion. And underneath inclusion, there's four um, specific um, sort of strands to that. One is about embedding inclusive practice. Uh, one is about prioritizing target cohorts, the likes of um, students with disabilities or, or students um, from socioeconomically disadvantaged backgrounds. Um, the third one is about providing consistent learner support. And the fourth one is about literacy and numeracy. And in particular, when we talk about UDL, I mean, UDL, you can see, affects all of those things. Uh, you know, the UDL practice can, can support all of those. But in particular, we've been able to get quite uh, you know good language around UD and UDL into the strategy in the embedded inclusive practice piece and the consistent learner support piece. So just to give you an example um, uh, about how universal design is referenced within that strategy, I've just put up a couple of quotation marks pulled from it. So the strategy makes a commitment to consistent learner support with a universal design approach underpinning learning development and delivery. And then later on, we talk about that and how that's driven by the ongoing reform of the funding system. So we're actually thinking at a funding level, okay, how is how is that actually going to, how, is, how can we provide consistent learner support underpinned by UD at a funding level? Um, and we get a specific reference then to the rollout of good practice guidelines, including those in relation to universal design for learning. So specific reference to these guidelines as a high level guideline for, for the system. So that's the strategy level taken care of. And as I said, once that happens, you'll find that the regional ETBs, the next time their review of strategy comes around, they start to reflect the language uh, of those um, those uh, national strategies. So uh, another major piece coming out of that we've mentioned there already is the national guidance. So we've been developing that guidance in, in tandem with the development of that strategy, really. Actually pretty excited because uh, Tom Tobin is in the room. I didn't even know he was coming today and I've just had a little slight chat with him today. I'll call on him in a minute to, to reflect on this with us because Tom actually came and helped us as an international uh, voice in this uh, and helped us and was one of the key authors of this dialogue with my colleague, Anne Heelan, and, uh, and I gave some contributions to, to the document myself. Um, but really, the, I suppose the big thing about this is that the guidance was built very much 
um, by the sector for the sector. So, um, of course, we were, uh, Tom and ourselves were given some of the UDL expertise, but we were very conscious of making a document that was going to work for everybody and that everybody had a voice in when, when we were uh, building it itself. So it involved some of the largest consultation uh, exercises, uh, well, the largest consultation exercise that I've ever been in. So it involved the formation of this uh, UDL for uh, FET National Committee, which is a high level stakeholder group. Um, that would involve uh, people from the state agencies, people from local agencies, practitioner groups, um, people from uh, areas like uh, the Centre for Guidance, which is a national career guidance centre, people from national disability organisations. Um, so it has a really broad range of high level sectoral um, involvement. And then there were subcommittees of that. So one subcommittee in particular that looked at this one was the practitioner subcommittee, which was the, you know focused on the practitioners on the ground who would actually be doing the teaching practice day to day. On top of that, we conducted seven uh, site visits of different centres all around to get a good sense of what the actual physical learning environments were that people were dealing with, what were the day-to-day -day challenges they were dealing with. I had interviews with countless practitioners and managers in those settings and we captured a huge range of, of good UDL practice that was already existing um, um, as part of that piece. Um, yeah, so I suppose that sector-wide consultation and um, the development, uh, the whole process, which went, actually went on really for a, a, the bones of a good year to 18 months, uh, then led to uh, the actual the, develop, the final development stages, which produced a full guidance document, uh, which as you can see on the screen, there is a, a screenshot of the front cover of that and a summary version as well. The full guidance is essentially nearly book length and then the summary version Version is the is the sort of twenty page dive in right there, a whole host of reflective tools to support the implementation that work alongside the guidance, so you can work through it and use the tools as you as you go through the guidance, or indeed you can use them as a separate piece. Um, we have. Uh, part of that guidance, I suppose, is about building networks. So it's actually this, as well as the 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 kind of brass tacks of UDL and what that looks like. There's also a lot of guidance in there around how you can start your own community in the local uh, the local uh, ETB or area you're in and there's also a digital online resource hub which is a whole suite of other resources that accompany it that's about to be launched in the coming I think it's about six weeks I hope it'll be some stage before the end of March um, and I'm delighted to say that Tom Tobin is in the room unexpectedly I wonder Tom would you like to just chime in if I had any reflections yourself on that process? Well, thanks Dara I appreciate it and uh, this document was really a collaborative effort. And uh, like what CAST has done with the UDL on campus website and inviting people to give their personal stories of how they're implementing UDL, that was the real bones of this FEDL for FET practitioners document as well. It is not set up like here's a scenario and here are the five things you need to do. It's very much story based. So you get to meet colleagues who are actually in the field addressing challenges and problems. And uh, it's for people with disability barriers, but also people with other kinds of barriers, like not speaking the language as a first language, like um, just being distant from the uh, colleges, universities, and FET centers, or lots of other barriers. And so through their stories, you can learn how to implement different UDL tactics. So I'm really grateful to all of my colleagues uh, at AHEAD and Solace and throughout the FET sector in Ireland. This is very much their story. And uh, it, it, it's kind of a gripping novel rather than it, yeah, a, a, yeah. a, a process guide. <laughs> yeah, that's... Tom's exactly right. It reads much more like like a novel, and we've taken the we took the approach really straight off the bat that we wanted to to apply UDL ideas in how we developed it. And um, so the why comes straight up for us, and that's why the stories are actually at the heart of everything we do. And as you'll even find things like cliffhangers in the <laughs> in the uh, in the novels in the guidance. So it is very much written, written like a novel rather than a, a dry piece of guidance. Anyway, so that UDL um, a guidance, I suppose, a key part of it is, as I said, that that goes straight into the performance agreement. So now each ETB has to report on a, on a periodic basis on how they're supporting the implementation on a local on a, a local basis. I suppose part of that then is okay. 
how are we going to support that regionally to be to, to support implementation of the guidance? Uh, so another piece that's working alongside this, it's not specific to the UDL FET project, but it has uh, become a very key part of how we deliver on it, is the production of national CPD. So in Ireland, we have a national forum for the enhancement of teaching and learning, which is a, a state body recognising excellence in teaching and learning. And we've worked with them to provide a national uh, micro credential for UDL, which we have uh, on our, ourselves and University College Dublin combined to develop. And what happens is essentially uh, the, at the first stage, we developed the suite of materials. We made them available as open source. Uh, we run national rollouts where participants, of course, of the course can do them themselves, but they can also learn to become facilitators and use the, the open source materials to go and do it in their own institutions. And as those trained facilitators, if they have the facilitators badge, they can actually go roll it out in their own institutions and have the power to award the credential at a local level as well. Uh, so what's happened is that we've begun to move to this model where we actually try to do it in partnership. So we start uh, and every year we have a national rollout. And what that means is we as uh, uh, the main course coordinators, that's UCD and the head, actually deliver the course centrally. But we have uh, facilitators partnering with us in local institutions all over the country, both in HE, uh, in higher education and in further education and training. So those local peer facilitators, what they essentially do is, is manage the local peer groups. Uh, we actually use a peer group model within those. So uh, that means they're working in groups of four all the way through. And that's, again, thinking about the community building thing. How do we start conversations at a local level? So they're, I suppose, within their small based peer groups at the, the very micro level, then at the institutional level, they're being managed by local facilitators and then we have us at a national picture and that means everybody's doing the course at the same time and we're able to use the power of social and other things to create a big dialogue um, in, on social media and etc but so the the contents of that is that they do 25 hours over 10 weeks uh, they, they cover all of the um the the principles of udl um, and they they work in peer groups as part of the institutional uh, communities to sort of brainstorm their first udl implementation or often their first udl in, implementation which they actually do is re in real time as part of the course and report on it so they select a teaching activity to, to confine it to and they apply udl to it and report on the results and I said they can all undertake the facilitators training option as well. To support that, we do provide lots of other CPD opportunities at a much smaller scale as well to, to jump in force. Just to give you an idea, uh, some of the badge outcomes for last year, which is the first time we did the national rollout. So within that national rollout, um, we had 21 facilitators across Ireland and different institutions uh, supporting them as, as local facilitators. Um, and 547 uh, people achieved the UDL badge uh, so 547 people undertook the 25 hours now have that credential and we also trained really excitingly 169 of those to, who took the add-on the optional add-on to become potentially involved uh, in in future facilitations as well so that means it gives us this really scalable model where you know this year we would hope to significantly increase those numbers again because of the the scale of new facilitators in new institutions who can pick up the baton and i suppose help us to to spread the good word and share the message so I'm going to jump uh, very uh, quickly over to Mark, who's going to give you the institutional view, but I suppose some key learning um, and things you might take away for um, where you are at, because I'm conscious people are at different places in the in that pyramid. Some of you might be individual practitioners, some of you might be working in at a national level and others at the, the MISO level. So. So some key things is that definitely the partnership is key. Um, if you're building policy and guidance for people, that it has to be built with all stakeholder concerns done and that means compromising sometimes as well you know uh, Tom will tell you there was a lot of painful <laughs> conversations that had to be had we had I think over the course of the two main feedback sessions uh, direct from the, the two main uh, stakeholder groups we had something like 180 pages of feedback <laughs> uh, so it was a very engaged process with a lot of people involved but what it meant is that you know when, you, when we use a specific terminology or a piece of language there isn't somebody sitting in a room quietly reading this now we're going no I'm not reading that putting that down that's not for me and um, because we, we, we were able to to make the document work for everybody uh, the community I mentioned that it's related to that really the community is connected so conversation across these levels matters so you have to we have to be thinking not about conversations just at, within your own level so just at the micro level making sure we can go have conversations that reach across the different stakeholder levels as well so that people at the national level understand the practitioner concerns and vice versa um, in terms of uh, policy make sure you build on what's there 
Mark has done some really interesting work on this in, D, in, in DCU where he's done that mapping exercise about showing people how UDL can meet their strategic priorities already. That's really important. So there's lots of different ways, lots of different uh, um, policies and, and uh, strategy goals in your institution that you can already evidence that UDL can help the, um, the institution to achieve. Um, and that practitioners need uh, tools and support, but I think above all, they need community. So they need to feel like they're participating in a, in a conversation. And that's whether that's at the, the sort of local level in the canteen or whether it's at an institutional level, that's really important. So I've taken up too much time, so I'm gonna jump to Mark. Thanks, Dara, and uh, I'll, I'll try to speed up and, and catch up here on the. Um, so as Dara said, he concentrated on the macro. I want to talk about the meso and what we've done in DCU, Dublin City University, um, and hopefully highlight some opportunities where we can uh, collaborate or indeed share any of our experience that may save you essentially reinventing the wheel. And from my perspective, I'd love to learn from what you've done and how we could take some of that back into DCU. If you could go next slide, please, sir. <clears throat> so our main drivers really come in from strategy, um, whether it's it's the, the university strategy, the specifically the teaching and learning strategy, or indeed um, national guidelines, quality, quality control and insurance guidelines, or national guidance documents around, uh, for example, the, the one there, the National Plan for Equity of Access. They are our drivers in why we want to uh, implement UDL. And we spent a lot of time influencing those documents, sitting on a range of committees, uh, myself and my colleagues, to have UDL in the everyday language. And that was, that was the first part, the first challenge for us, trying to socialize the idea of UDL rather than come down with legislation or frameworks or anything else, we, we wanted to socialize the language and get it in there. And I actually have a quote that we've taken out of the um, teaching and learning strategy, and I'm delighted that we got it in. We fought hard to get it in because every word is, is scrutinized going into these type of documents. But it was important that universal design was called out specifically by our senior management. If you could go next slide, please, sir. Thanks. So we, we decided it's a, it's a multifaceted approach that I want to talk to you today. And as I say, hopefully you may be able to replicate some of these, uh, cherry pick the ones that suit you and your organization. And as I said, I would welcome feedback from yourselves as to how we may improve our approach as well. We looked at policies and guidelines. We looked at the professional development of our staff and we looked at the technology infrastructure that we had. So. There are many other facets that we looked at, but for the purpose of today, I just want to concentrate on, on these three. Sarah, if you could just go next slide, please. Um, the policy and guidelines. So what we wanted to do was to establish an, an all university or all departments uh, university um, <clears throat> working group to tackle this. So we had student representatives and then we had representatives from every faculty, every unit uh, and every group within the uh, organization. And what we did was we undertook a mapping uh, a mapping uh, process that Dara alluded to earlier on, and I'll show you that now in a second. And indeed we devised short checklists and little flyers and, and, and user guides, just again to try socialize the idea. And I have here planting the seed. And a lot of it really was planting the seed in the senior management's um, line because we wanted them to have buy-in into this, them to have ownership, but also we wanted to explain to the staff that the people working at the, at the cold face essentially on the front line, we wanted to explain to them why UDL was important and that's why we had to get their buy-in, uh, doing stuff with them rather than doing stuff to them. That was the approach that we wanted to take. If you could go next slide please, sir. <clears throat> Here's an example of the um, strategy connections grid. So it, it's a words document, uh, incredibly long. There's three pages here represented in small icons on the right hand side of the screen. But I just zoomed in in, in the first one. And the document is made up of, of three different columns as you'll see there. First one is a link to the, uh, the document or policy. The second one is a, a little brief explaining uh, what this document is about. And then the third one, this is where the meat is. This is where the, the meat and the sandwich is here, here really. Uh, we want to show how does UDL 
meet this strategy or meet this policy. And we went through all the policies, all the, the strategies that we have. And believe me, in a university, there are a ton of documents. Um, <clears throat> and what we decided to do then was to map out exactly how UDL fitted. So then when we were trying to, to sell the concept of UDL, for want of a better expression, when we were trying to get buy-in from staff, we said, well, by doing UDL, you're meeting this strategy, this policy, that policy, this strategy, and so on. So we, we spelled it out for them and we helped them for their, their whether it's the heads of school or heads of roles, um, reporting on their, their um, targets towards the, the strategy or whether it was individuals wanted to actually say how they met the strategy when they're applying for promotion. Uh, we wanted to spell it out to them and hand it to them on a plate. If you could go next slide, please, sir. The second thing that we wanted to do was to create a series of checklists and user guides. And here, what we did, we took the past, um, <clears throat> the, the, the UDL principles, and each point of the, each guideline and indeed various different checkpoints. And we gave them suggestions as to what they could do in their virtual learning environment or indeed in their classroom. And we took it across three levels because we recognized there may be new staff, there may be quite experienced staff, and then there might be what we call expert staff in there. Um, so we wanted to have something for everybody in the audience. And this checklist, which is freely available, I'll put the link in, in the chat later on, this checklist then uh, had something for everybody. We didn't say you had to have a tick in every box. We just wanted to give people ideas and suggestions as to how they could make uh, UDL part of their practice. Again, handing it to them on a plate. Um, <clears throat> so the, thanks Darren, red mind. Um, the next element that I wanted to talk about uh, was professional development. <clears throat> and what we wanted to do, and this is for staff and for students, we gave our, our students, for example, early access to our content. We gave them a welcome to DCU um, <clears throat> pack of what we call Discover DCU. And that was made up of a whole load of resources, study skills, writing skills, uh, technology skills, all sorts of different things that would make their university life that little bit easier. But for uh, specific purposes, when we're thinking about access students or what we call widening participation students, we wanted to give it to them before they even set foot on campus. So they didn't have to wait till that first day when they arrive on campus and there's 18,000 other students all around them. We wanted them to have these resources in the comfort of their own home. As soon as they accepted their place in DCU, they got access to our VLE and had this suite of 40 hours worth of content for them to navigate through. We also worked with Dara and, and his team in UDL, and we had over 20 of our staff go through the UDL badge, and several of them now are UDL facilitators, so they can deliver that badge internally within DCU. And every one of our workshops, absolutely every one of them, didn't matter whether it was on assessment, whether it was on learning design, whether it was on learning technology, every one of them has UDL embedded into it. It's essentially the foundations of what we do uh, because we want to get back to that where we are putting it in as part of the everyday language to help socialize what we do, um, socialize the concept of UDL. And it just comes second nature to them. That's what we hope will be the case. And all of our resources and all of our workshops, I will be delighted to share. Uh, and particularly where we have resources like talking about learning design and how we've actually brought in UDL into that conversation. If you can go next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> then the last bit I wanna talk about really is the technology. The, we introduce a number of ways to improve and embed UDL into what we do. We have Moodle as a virtual learning uh, platform and we introduced templates, templates that were had a minimum standard UDL standard. Uh, and there was, if memory serves, nine different features of the VLE, which we implemented as core for every single standard, every single course. That's not to say that lecturers couldn't customize it and make it their own, but there was that minimum standard that was there. We also introduced a, uh, an accessibility block on every course page, which allows a user, um, an individual student or an individual lecturer, customize that page by changing the font, the color, the background size, 
all sorts of different things and the screen readers and everything built in there. And just as a point of information, that's a, a Moodle plugin that's available to anybody uh, worldwide that uses Moodle, but we're undertaking an upgrade of that over the summer and we'll be releasing that back out to the community to um, make it available to all, all Moodle users. We have introduced a reporting functionality within our uh, VLE. So I now can run a report on every single module page on our VLE and identify what we are, are calling our find it, our fix it, and our future proof it approach. So find, fix, and future proof, find errors, fix the errors, and then stop them happening again. Um, and this 3F approach that we have um, <clears throat> is available so we can do reports on, on a module level, on a program level, and indeed at a school and faculty level. And that allows us as a central unit to identify as the, the staff development needs so we can have targeted CPD, targeted continuous professional development for our staff. And because we have the reporting capabilities, we can measure the impact because we do the training, we, we, we do the reports, we do the training, then we do the reports again and see what's happened, what's different. And we introduced uh, UDL-based assessments, video-based assessments. Um, we, we took the approach where everybody was going, looking at uh, trying to move their assessments online and trying to come up with proctoring solutions and so on. We flipped it on its head and said, how can we redesign the assessment to make it more UDL uh, friendly, more UDL compliant? And, and we took a completely different approach than most with the, the assessments. And I have a search and tag here where um, videos that are put up, if for example, I put up 10 videos on my course page, a student can type in a keyword into the search box and it will search for that keyword across all 10 videos. Again, just making it easy for all students, not just students with um, learning difficulties, all students uh, to access content and, and put it at their fingertips. We gave Zoom access to Zoom accounts to every single student. Um, and the reason being is we wanted them to have the, the, the power to, to set up with uh, group meetings with, with our colleagues, or indeed we've industry mentorship programs set up. And indeed we just wanted them to become familiar with the technology so it's no longer a barrier in the classroom. And we created or in the process of creating a speakeasy uh, session, a virtual cafe, for people to, to come in and access at their leisure, just literally to, to, to shoot the breeze for want of a better expression, to come in and talk anything else but classes, anything else but, but subject matter. Um, and the last thing we did was we created hybrid classrooms because we're very aware, as I'm sure is the same case in your own states, your own countries, um, we're gonna have students for a long time to come that aren't gonna be able to come to the university and what we now have is the capability of students can join in remotely and fully engage because we invested heavily in the technology within uh, a selection of classrooms, putting in proper high-end microphones, high-end cameras in there, multiple screens to ensure the student at home or indeed in industry has the same um, experience as the student in, in the classroom. So all of these things, and I can share them all with you, the specifications for our classroom, the equipment we've gotten, the, the um, results that we've got from our, our various different reports, I'd be delighted to share them with you. But the um, <clears throat> thing that I want to get across to you is, and I want to leave it all out open for questions now, is it's all about, it is a multifaceted approach that you need to take but it's all about embedding in the concepts of UDL into the everyday language that we speak. And just on that note, perfectly timed, there are our contact details, Dara's and, and my own. And if you want to ask any questions, either now put them in the chat box or indeed um, turn on the microphone and shoot away. Just catching up on the text, so bear with me a second. So while folks were typing in questions, I'm assuming that will be happening. Um, I had a question about, tell me about the video-based assessments. Yeah, so, and, and I had a, a personal interest in this because my daughter suffers, my eldest daughter suffers from anxiety. And when she was uh, 
told in second year she had to do a presentation and fourth year she wanted to drop out of college. Um, so we actually changed it. We looked at the learning outcomes of the particular course and uh, where it said they had to be able to communicate. There was nowhere in the guidelines or in the course requirements where it said they had to stand up for 10 minutes in front of their 200 classmates and flick through PowerPoint slides. Um, and that was on purpose that we weren't that specific with it. So we actually set it up where a student could record their presentation and uh, record their, their skill or whatever the case may be, their, their activity, and present it in an easy fashion to the lecturers. Now that, uh, it sounds quite straightforward, but anybody that's uh, had any experience with video will know that there's so many different formats, so many different file types, so many different uh, platforms that uh, it's very difficult to take that video from the student and share it in an easy fashion with the, the lecturer. We actually circumvented all of that. We introduced video-based assessments and it got to the stage where, and I'll give an example from a nursing scenario, where nurses used to have to record a clinical skill, uh, what we call an OSCE um, in, in Dublin, and they had to do hand washing, they had to do injections, blood pressure, standard uh, procedures for, for nurses. But it was like um, <clears throat> a live performance they used to have to do in front of their lecture, and it was like a conveyor belt. Every nurse would come in, they'd have their five minutes on the spotlight, and the next nurse would come in. Um, we fine tuned that by replacing that with video just for hand washing. And they did all the hand washing. The lecturer was able to look at the video at their leisure. The students did it in a peer assessment style way where they, um, one student recorded another student. And when they were happy, they submitted that video as, as an assessment. A much better learning experience for the students, a much better teaching experience for the staff member and the feedback became a dialogue then as opposed to a monologue and all of that was on the basis of some students got anxiety and didn't want to actually stand up and perform so we flipped it on its head we didn't want to just have an assessment specifically for those that suffered from anxiety and then a, a different assessment for everybody else we took a universal design approach to the assessment and we allowed them to do it and strikingly out of that particular example the students asked for us and and some went as far as demand us um for the other clinical skills that they had to do and we found them in the inside in in, in the uh, we have stimulated wards within our um <clears throat> university and we found them actually practicing recording one another on their mobile phones doing the other skills uh, even though that wasn't part of the assessment but they just found that technique and that approach very powerful Thank you. Um, there have been a couple of questions that have come through in the chat um, asking about, you know, if you're using videos, how are you doing the, um, are there students being asked also to make sure there are captions? And then there was another uh, question about, um, I can't remember where it went, plat video platforms. And I think some of those are being answered in the chat. There was one that came up. Um, I'm copying okay, them so over to the Google Docs so it's easier to find them. Um, Perfect. Scroll Thank down you. to the bottom in that. Yeah, I think, I think Celine has asked there. I might jump in on that. So yeah. Celine's asked me there. Um, can you please summarize your your targeted student body with the the UDL for FET projects? I think maybe she just wasn't clear about what the age range was and what FET was actually serving. Um, and she asked was asking asking about the approximate numbers of faculty skills, etc. Um, so basically, FE uh, for education and training, um, is serving uh, learners who are generally post 16 years of age. Um, so it's it's that body of, of people who are not uh, higher education, but they might be doing uh, either transition programs or post-secondary skill programs. So I think the community college sector in the US, for example, would, would kind of cover a lot of these individuals, but it also does uh, include a whole range of courses for, for example, specialist training provision for people with intellectual disabilities. It might um, include things like uh, youth reach programs, which are students who have behavioral difficulties and fall out of school. Um, but it would also include things like apprenticeship programs, so things like trades if you're in woodwork or uh, joinery. So it's a very, very broad sector. In Ireland, it serves about 350,000 learners, um, and that's about 10,000 FET professionals. So it's right across the, the national population of Ireland, and it's 
there's vet centers in every single community in Ireland and they range from very different sizes. So some of them, you might only have a center that uh, serves 200 learners in a very, very small town or village, right up to co uh, cottages that serve maybe two to three thousand, yeah, um, two to three thousand for some of the, the kind of larger um, ones. But that's kind of the rough size of them. So generally much smaller than um, much smaller than higher education institutions, but that's partly because the, the remit of uh, is to uh, serve people in every community. So I suppose when we talk, there's 10,000 professionals across Ireland. Um, and when we talk about the numbers with the digital badge, 350 of those uh, this year were in in FET. So you can do the math there. It's still, it's still a significant percentage, even though it's small overall, it's still a significant percentage. And we hope to make big gains over the next coming years now that we have a model that works and we have all of those national um, pieces of guidance that can that can support um, practitioners to, to, to understand it and use it. Thank you so much. We're, we're just about out of time for our first group of presenters. There's some questions that have been populated into the Google Doc. So Mark and Dara, as, as we go to our next group, um, if you want to peep in there and see if you can answer any of those, that's great. Um, so this has been really interesting. I took a lot of notes, which is unlike me. So that was great. Um, we're going to move on to our next group now. So if you all don't mind to stop your share. And let's see. So our next group is um, from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. We have Jean Durko, Irina Laboda, and then Miriam Larson was unable to be with us today, but she did contribute to the, um, the creation of their uh, slides today. So we will go ahead and turn that over to our next group. Hey, thank you, Jennifer. I'm gonna share my desktop and get going here. Hi everyone, we're delighted to be here today from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, where it's, uh, I don't know, balmy 30 degrees or something out there and snow flurrying. Um, we're gonna be talking about how we implemented UDL at our university. I'm Jean Durko. I'm an executive director in the Office of Information Technology. And one of the groups um, I'm in my scope is all the folks that deal with teaching and learning and faculty at the University of Tennessee. Irina? Hello, I'm a senior learning technology specialist with the Office of Information Technology at the University of Tennessee. And uh, in the role of instructional designer, I'm assisting our faculty to move their courses online. Irina, there's a glaring light behind your head making you pretty dark. So uh, I think it's the sun. Okay, I'll try to keep straight. I don't have curtains there. <laughs> there you go. Okay, good. Um, and Miriam Larson um, couldn't be with us today, but she is also a senior learning um, technology specialist, an instructional designer, and also a multimedia developer. And she had already decided to pre-record her session, her part of the session, so you'll be hearing from her uh, shortly. So getting started, we implemented UDL training for our instructional designers in the fall really of 2016. Um, Eric Moore, I found at the university and hired him part-time when he was still a grad student to help develop, well actually he developed that training for us without him I don't know where it would be today with UDL. Um, and then in the spring of 2017, we were able to hire Eric full-time as in a regular staff position. And we used that course and his first task was to get all the instructional designers trained in UDL where it becomes just you know second nature to them. And so he used a number of techniques to engage everyone um, to, toward this professional development activity that's centered on really creating instruction, implementing UDL principles. And one of the things I really insisted on was old school. I know we're free, I'm in the Office of Information Technology. We're always using technology. But we had this huge bulletin board that people passed many times a day in this hallway. And I said, let's make that about UDL. So it's in their face. It's not just when they log in or wherever the training is. It's every time they go up and down the hallway. So it kind of had introduced them to universal design with architecture and then the guidelines for learning. Even in this little circle here, we had physical handouts of all the checkpoints that people could go and grab when they needed one. 
And then we had different scenarios that they engaged with online individually and then as teams. And every this part was transitional and got updated with whatever the scenarios were for, for that week. Um, then after the training, they began incorporating the UD principles in online course development work. So that was really in um, summer and fall of 2018, 2017, and also into 2018. It was really um, a great way to learn, but these people were spread in two different working groups. And I realized I kind of had another problem that wasn't really UDL, but just common sense. We had to reorganize some of the folks in these two groups. So this is how the groups did look. So you'll see instructional designers in two columns. In group two, they mostly did LMS support, but as part of that job, they were helping people make decisions about their online courses, and they really identified as instructional designers. The designers in group one really did, they also helped people with their online courses and use the LMS, but it was a little bit different kind of support and a little more traditional when you think of instructional designer. But we were having a little bit of a us and them mentality, and I needed a we mentality among all the instructional designers. And so I had this aha moment, and we redesigned everyone, we reorganized. And this structure makes so much more sense because with this one, you know, it was sort of like taking on history and where people were historically. Then I'd be asked, take on this group. And I'd have to think, where do they, where can I put them? Where is a manager have, you know, bandwidth and not just have one group heavily loaded up and one not. So that's how video production ended in group two. They're slotted there originally. But this makes so much more sense. So now the instructional designers all know more about the LMS because they're all doing some level of LMS support as well as designing. And then some of them do more LMS than designing, but they're all one cohesive group now. And group one is happier because they've got the video folks in with the graphic designers. And then we've got folks who support the classroom technologies as well. So they still are on the same hallway. They still all work together. Nobody really switched offices, um, but they aligned a little differently and people function better now. The next thing we needed to do once everyone was together in one group was standardize our instructional design and review process. So up until now, um, people, we would take requests for help all year round, we still do it all year round, but it would come in as a ticket. And if a ticket came in for a course, we'd, design, you know, we'd have a designer assigned to, to that ticket. Um, so everybody had their own way of creating courses and their own way of interacting with faculty. And we wanted it to be a little more cohesive so that different faculty members had very similar experiences in our group. So all the designers came together, came up with a standardized um, instructional design process documents to support that. We have a review process now. We have an administrative review after the design is complete and then several review processes to show progress, how the course is laid out to your peers. So people who aren't involved in that project to can give you another point of view. Um, so they, we standardize it. We started implementing it in 2019 and then we initiated the Jumpstart cohort program in the fall of 2019. We're now three times a year. We have up to 20 faculty um, jump in and do a two semester development process with us. And Irene is going to tell you more about that. I'll just give you the basics. We have up to 20 cohort participants a semester. They're, they are nominated by their dean or department head. Um, they are mostly uh, contributing to a online program that's being developed. It's, uh, we developed self-paced online training that incorporated UDL principles. Uh, we have an instructional designer assigned to every online course project. We have also an option for faculty to um, partner with us for media, either instructional video, multimedia interactions, graphic design. 
The one caveat with that is that it takes more development time for the faculty because they have to write a video script or pull all their content together. So we really um, try to tell them at the ahead of time what the time commitment is for the Jumpstart cohort program, but they also get us helping them quite a bit. So it is a little bit of a trade-off. All courses now use the same development process. So it's there's still variation between different designers as far as their personality and how they approach things, but we have a very um, standard process now that everyone adheres to. And we have a Canvas course template and all courses utilize that course template. Irina? Thank you, Jean. So on this screenshot, you see the Canvas dashboard. Uh, our LMS is Canvas with three Jumpstart training sites, each for a separate cohort. And I'm going to take you on a quick tour of one training site and comment on a few design elements that go in line with EDL principles. Uh, so Jean, if you move to the next slide, actually even uh, before the training starts, we try to set our develop course developers for success and support their strategic planning in advance. Uh, each faculty member receives a brief email and brief is the key actually, uh, with expectations for their participation. So they, um, they should know how many hours per week they should expect to spend on training, how many hours per week they should spend, uh, they should expect to spend on course development. Uh, we tell them about major milestones for uh, training and course development and some other details. And uh, they have to reply to that email and agree to the terms before they can access the Canvas training site. And let's move to the next slide. And actually, this is just a screenshot of that training, and I'm going to uh, share my web browser. So, Jean, if you can stop sharing, and I'm going to share. Okay, so now you should be able to see the web browser. <clears throat> and uh, here is the home page of the Jumpstart training. Uh, at the beginning of the training, all the faculty participants are greeted with a video, video message from the uh, leadership of two sponsoring organizations. And uh, there, uh, there is a photo, I don't know why it doesn't show <laughs> for some reason, it's just good luck, uh, of instructional designers uh, who are greeting, uh, our faculty and they will be supporting them during the training and after the tra training. And oh, here they, here they are, <laughs> took some time. Uh, and then uh, an important, el important element of our homepage is uh, a clear division of roles and responsibilities between uh, our unit, supporting unit and the faculty. So all these little details, they actually add accountability and uh, uh, really strategic planning uh, helped to uh, our faculty to plan strategically. And at this point, I want to make a disclaimer. As an instructional designer, um, learning UDL for me was like learning a new language, uh, a foreign language. You learn grammar rules uh, at the beginning, but once you start speaking, you don't think about grammar. So the same was with UDL. We went as in, uh, in, a group of instructional designers, we went through the UDL training, uh, but then many design decisions started coming like as common sense, very naturally. So as I'm going to point, point to some elements in this training, uh, I'm not going to say this is this checkpoint or that checkpoint, I'll let you map those elements to specific UDL checkpoints. Now I'm going to move to the modules and I actually have them, have this page open. So where we build the, in the, uh, on this page, we build a clear structure of topics and the assignments and consistent navigation. And notice that Canvas allows to set the requirements uh, to complete all items in the module. And uh, there is a check mark every time when uh, this requirement is met, for example, a page is viewed or um, an assignment is submitted. 
So it gives a nice visual checklist uh, to our participants on where they are and how they progress through the training. And I think, uh, Jean, you mentioned that there are four modules in this training, uh, and the training lasts eight weeks. And initially, we um, thought we were not going to micromanage our faculty. We will just give them one due date to complete the assignment, uh, to complete the entire training. And actually, that didn't go very well. We realized that our faculty definitely need some help with time management. So we broke the modules uh, into weeks. Uh, we set uh, a due date for each assignment and due dates fall on uh, the same day of the week. We made sure that um, they, uh, our faculty participants can see those due dates, even though due dates are entered only once, but they appear in several places. Uh, like you can see it on the modules page here. Uh, uh, participants can see it when they actually are, uh, when they are on the assignment page, when they open that page, uh, they can see it on the calendar. And just in case, to be sure, we also uh, put the outline in PDF with all the due dates, with topics and assignments. Um, and actually that strategy worked. Uh, we had uh, fewer late submissions. Uh, so now I'm going to move to the uh, first assignment, which is, uh, I think, by far the most favorite part of training for many people. And the assignment is to review uh, several online courses developed by their peers uh, from previous cohorts. And it really helps uh, faculty who, who have never taught online, especially asynchronously, to visualize how their future online courses may look and also see how different uh, online courses can be. Uh, so uh, we definitely plan to grow our collection of sample courses. Right now, I think we have only undergrads, so we plan to add one graduate course or several graduate courses and more disciplines. Uh, and now I'm going back to the modules. Uh, and notice that I'm going to open module, expand module two. Notice that early in the training, we included UDL as a topic because we wanted our course developers to approach all remaining topics uh, uh, like active learning or content development with a good understanding of UDL principles. Uh, and you see that there are several pages uh, in the uh, that address the why of UDL, the, how, the what of UDL, and the last page is the how of UDL. And the last page is very important, uh, I think, for our faculty uh, because uh, on that page, uh, we have several practical questions uh, that encourage faculty to think how to design their learning outcomes, assessments, instructional materials, knowing uh, the basic principles of UDL and considering the diversity of learning, and uh, which is very important not to get overwhelmed in the process. So this page is followed by an assignment where um, our faculty participants have to choose uh, several questions and see how they apply, how they can resolve these instructional challenges in their own course. Um, and uh, let me go back to the modules. Uh, and notice that each module opens uh, with an overview and learning outcomes, uh, which is, I guess, pretty traditional, right? An overview a list of topics, uh, a list of learning outcomes, and a list of assignments. Uh, and also, each module ends with a summary. So the summary gives both a visual view of uh, the progress uh, in training and the summary of accomplishments for this module, and a transition to the next module. So all assignments are directly related to the courses uh, that our participants develop and the, their actual, actual course design assignments. Uh, so here, I'll give you an example. We have uh, a page and an assignment creating uh, your course schedule. And on this page, we use a chart to remind faculty where they are in the backward design process. And actually backward design is introduced in, in the first module, in module one. Uh, and then how this specific assignment builds on the previous work uh, and how this assignment fits into, into the entire training. So the first 
uh, a row is, uh, these are the stages of backward design. Then we uh, show them what modules uh, correspond to those topics. And the last row are the assignments that they're accomplishing. So the entire picture is right in front of them. And for each course design assignment, we provide a template that uh, our faculty can download and also examples. So we are very uh, strong with examples in this training. Uh, these are some um, sample course schedules that were completed by our uh, co uh, by the members of the cohort from the previous training. Uh, and one more thing that I want to emphasize back to our instructional designers, uh, our ideas make, make it clear from the beginning that uh, we are there for the faculty participants, that we are ready to meet with them at any point, that actually we do meet at least once during the train, training. And of course, after the training, during the course development process, we introduce by, uh, ourselves by email on the first day of training, we participate in uh, asynchronous discussions, and of course, give feedback to our faculty on their course design submissions. So that was the training that we provided to the faculty. Now we'll uh, show uh, the video, video presentation by Miriam Larson, uh, who will actually show the product, those courses that were developed by this faculty. So I think I share the sound. Uh, and I want to give you a heads up that the first 20 seconds, uh, nothing is displayed. It's black screen, but then uh, Miriam will be showing the courses. I'm going to take you on a brief tour of two of the courses from the Jumpstart program to show you some examples of how our designers and the faculty we've mentored have been able to incorporate the UDL checkpoints into online course design. The instructors have given us permission to showcase the two courses, which are both in a development form and do not include real students or student data. Dr. Sam Swan teaches in the Journalism and Electronic Media Department, and we'll take a look at his Global Communications course, which is part of the Online Master's Program in Strategic and Digital Communication. Dr. Stephen Neal teaches in the Chemistry Department, and we'll be looking at his Organic Chemistry course. So let's start with the first column of the UDL guidelines and uh, the engagement column. Um, to provide multiple means of engagement, these two courses both recruit interest by seeking to minimize threats and distractions by using a simple layout on the home page. Both provide easy links to content from the home page and prominent buttons to key items like the syllabus. For Sam's course, each module is linked from the home page, and in both courses, visual task maps are provided at the start of each module to clearly show the path that students are to take. Sam's course optimizes individual choice and autonomy in some of the assignments by allowing students to select the media format for their posts. This same checkpoint is reinforced along with the relevance, value, and authenticity of the content through the very first Introduce Yourself discussion board exercise that prompts students to select job duties related to the course from an attachment or from job ad descriptions that align to their individual career goals. This same exercise supports the first checkpoint under sustaining effort and persistence by hiding, heightening the salience of goals and objectives for students. In addition, the module outcomes in Sam's course are provided in the form of focus questions that students might ask, and these are in turn the discussion topics for their interaction in small group discussion groups. They are encouraged to read the questions prior to doing the readings and watching the video lectures, and then they can download a note sheet with the questions to keep track of things they want to discuss with their peers. Sam's course is an asynchronous course but he was really loath to lose the discussion opportunities. So we are assigning students to small groups and having them decide amongst themselves whether they can have their discussion synchronously via Zoom at a time convenient to them all or asynchronously via the Canvas group pages. They are then to produce a Google document summary of their discussion formatted to address the focus questions as well as any other topics that they want to include. This then hits yet another checkpoint 
by fostering collaboration and community within an asynchronous course. In the area of self-regulation, Sam's course helps to develop self-assessment and foster reflection in many ways. But the individual reflection exercises, the assignment rubrics, and the fact that students peer critique each other's major assignments also provide students with a means of comparison to support self-assessment and reflection. In this same category, Stephen Neal's organic chemistry course helps to promote expectations and beliefs that optimize motivation. With an introductory video that acknowledges that organic chemistry has a reputation for being very difficult. Let's just listen for a minute to what he has to say here. So if you have any questions about the chemistry program, I'm happy to help. Now, chances are you know someone whether it's a teacher, a doctor, a pharmacist, so on, who took organic chemistry and have a horror story about the experience. Fear of this course seems to follow students as they enter the classroom, even a virtual one as we have here today. I want you to know that yes, this class is difficult. Yes, you will be pushed to do things you didn't think you could do. Yes, you will put in hours upon hours of work. But most importantly, yes, you can do this. It is possible. Organic chemistry is all about molecules containing carbon. It doesn't seem to narrow it down too much, does it? Here you will learn how to read organic structures, predict their reactivity, and build new molecules using reactions we cover in class. You'll also find the strategies needed for success in this class will be important well beyond our time together. You'll not only build a chemical toolkit, you will build and refine your study skills. He further facilitates their personal coping skills and strategies with a graphic that illustrates the means of help available to students. Moving on to the second column of the guidelines, the representation column. To provide multiple means of representation, specifically in the area of perception, there are um, the alternatives for auditory and visual information are addressed through close closed captioning for all videos in both courses and alternative text for the images in the courses. And icons are also used throughout the courses to enable students to locate key types of information. For language and symbols, Neil's course does a great job of both clarifying vocabulary, symbols, syntax, and structure. And Sam's course explicitly describes the course structure for students. Both courses do a great job of illustrating concepts through the use of multi, uh, multiple media with an abundance of images, video, and text. With respect to addressing comprehension, Sam's course is taken by students from a broad variety of backgrounds, so there's often a difference in the type of background knowledge between students. This is addressed with links to applicable background knowledge and activities that encourage students to share their experiences to enrich the knowledge base of others. Neil's course does a great job of highlighting patterns, critical features, big ideas, and relationships, which is also necessary for a difficult to topic. He provides an abundance of practice exercises through an interaction that enables students to begin to recognize the critical features of reaction sites in molecules. This also serves to guide their information processing and visualization and serves to maximize the transfer of learning and generalization to future practice. SAM's course as well is designed to maximize transfer through the use of authentic scenarios. Finally, let's move on to the third column, the action and expression column. In the area of physical action, all the Jumpstart courses go through a quality control and accessibility review process to ensure that the navigation and response and access to the tools and assistive technologies have been considered in the design. As just one example, all interactive activities we design can be navigated by a keyboard or mouse. And students are reminded of where to go and what to do if they need to check out a laptop or production equipment and about the software that is available to them at no additional cost, that is, through their technology fees.
Thank you, Miriam. So now I'm going back to our presentation. And um, now that you looked at, one second. I'll just share faculty feedback with you. Uh, that they provided at the end of the training. So for example, here you can see one of the responses was about helpfulness of the uh, course and all faculty participants responded that they found this training helpful. And these are just a few uh, quotes from our uh, participants. Uh, they found that our resources very useful links uh, and this quote specifically talks about UDL. I'll just let you read it. And the next quote is about collaboration and uh, cooperation with uh, other peers. Uh, even though this training was uh, uh, designed as an asynchronous experience, uh, but our faculty found it very useful. They got like a good taste of how collaboration is possible in an asynchronous class. Uh, and uh, we were very pleased uh, to see that our faculty were making changes. They found this information so useful in the training that they were making changes uh, as they were going through the training in their actual courses. And these are just a few things that uh, our participants wanted more. They wanted more feedback from their ideas. Uh, they wanted more discussions. Uh, they wanted more real life experience in, in the synchronous class. Uh, they wanted more experience with uh, multimedia. And actually they did get uh, most of these things after the training when they started working on the, on the development of the online course. So, and this is a screenshot of our cohort meeting last October. Uh, that, was, uh, that meeting happened when uh, our faculty participants completed their training. Uh, they already had uh, their multimedia components, course components developed by uh, our office, and they started working on uh, their course in Canvas. And you can see that they pretty much enjoyed this meeting very, uh, very much. And uh, one of the activities was to share their course design ideas uh, uh, in breakout rooms, in groups. Uh, and this is just an example um, how the um, one group found was very impressed with this cooking video <laughs> assignment. So the uh, original assignment was uh, for students to cook something that was invented uh, in 16th centuries based on a cookbook uh, published in that century. That was the uh, period that they were studied uh, in their course introduction to Hispanic culture. So um, this instructor figure out how to move it to the online format, uh, mostly by simplifying, simplifying the recipe. Uh, our group produced a video demonstration where he actually showed how to do this recipe. And uh, the students were cooking this dish in real time uh, with uh, uh, using the Zoom session zoom session with videos on and according to this instructor it was a very successful assignment so this is just to give you a gist of uh, our training uh, and how it helped our faculty um, to develop online courses with uh, uh, udl perspective and now i'm giving it back to jean well, I just want to thank everyone for joining us for this quick overview of our journey into making UDL not just a list of checkpoints, but part of our culture and the common sense decision making when developing a new online course or redesigning an existing course. Starting with the training and then the reorganization of people, processes and procedures, this journey spanned about three to four years to so um, now we're happy to 
take any questions. And we will, Mark, we will ask um, Miriam about sharing out that video. It, it is a really nice, concise um, video. Great, yeah, I hope people will continue to add questions in the chat. Um, the only two questions I think that have come in so far have been about the videos. So, <laughs> so hopefully we'll have a couple more come in here in just a second. Let's see. And again, you can always unmute too, folks, if you've got questions. You don't have to type sure. in the chat yeah. unless you want. I feel like this was a teachable moment. Nobody has a question. Irina, we, we did a good job. <laughs> Getting a lot, of, a lot of positive feedback for all of us um, on, on the team there in the chat, if you're not able to see that, um, Irina and Jean. Um, yeah, so so um, Tian Hong was talking about the how she appreciates the focused questions replacing the learning outcomes you know related to to inquiry based learning and so forth yeah students have really responded positively to that um, pia is asking of course we are on the udl club um, but what were possible negative feedback was there related to udl um, so so maybe you know as i was sort of promoting udl on the team um, Irina, you spoke a little bit about how it felt like a foreign language at first, you know, like one other thing to, to learn. Was there, was there other pushback that you experienced or that we experienced from faculty? I think it's the same for um, instructional designers and support group and the faculty, just to be uh, being uh, overwhelmed <laughs> with, uh, with the, this uh, task of implementing UDL. And I know Eric, uh, when you con contributed the content to this training, you did speak about that, uh, that um, you just find some, uh, something very specific challenge uh, and see how you can uh, overcome this challenge uh, in your course uh, and start small, uh, just get the taste of that. So I think, uh, Again, the barrier was uh, uh, being overwhelmed. Uh. Yeah, and even the training for instructional designers, we pretty much allotted about six months for that to start percolating with people. One thing I forgot to mention about the bulletin board is when we changed out those um, kind of the discussion points weekly, people did gather there and talk about it. And it was just another way for people to, you know, meet, meet each other and, and talk about this common problem that UDL was trying to solve that they were working on that week, so. Um, Allison, I'm not sure I, I understand exactly what you're asking. Do you mean that to uh, offer the Jumpstart course? No, just that the investment of time that it took to put into the course at the beginning, I'm sure made it so the next time you go to offer any of it, it's there, you know, those videos are the content, the questions, right. so then yeah. it's an initial investment maybe, but then in the long run, um, worth it. Yeah, and every semester, well, for the Jumpstart uh, training, every semester they tweak it up a little bit from feedback they got or some new resource. Um, but yes, it's a long term investment approach, even the template that we created for for people to use. I mean, they look slightly different course to course, but it's the same layout. That's what students say they want. They don't want to have to relearn every course. You know, they go in and relearn the navigation. So it's a definitely a, a long term vision. Okay, well, um, we're getting pretty close to time here. So if folks still have questions, please uh, feel free to add those in the uh, Google Doc and we can 
send those out to the participants and uh, presenters. Um, but I just want to take a moment to thank uh, all of our presenters today. This has been really great. I've learned so much. I'm so glad. I'm so glad we did this. Um, and if you have something that you would want to share with our group um, as a, a member spotlight, we will have one coming up here in a, uh, several months. So we um, would love to hear from you. So please feel free to send us an email to Eric or to myself, and we'll um, hopefully get you up and going. So thanks, everybody. Have a great afternoon. And we look forward to seeing you all in May. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.